I love what I do. Um, I never am bored. I'm stressed sometimes, but I'm never ever bored. I've gotten into some really interesting scientific problems that are really complicated problems that our society is dealing with. And I feel like with the team that I've been able to assemble here at UC Davis, that we're actually generating some really important insights that will make life better for people in the future as we move forward. The Veterinary Medicine School is number one in the country and it's this in incredible resource, of course, to have. But I, I think what really distinguishes it is the type of research that we do here, which is uh, incredibly multidisciplinary. There's so much interconnectedness here that allow things like the Counteract program that spans all the major colleges here on campus. And, and in a single table, in a single meeting, you have chemists and neurologists and toxicologists um, and engineers all tackling the same problem. The Counteract Center is um, part of an NIH program um, called Counteract and that stands for Countermeasures Against Chemical Threat Agents. Our goal here in our center is to look at chemical threat agents that trigger seizures. There is a real credible threat that terrorists or perhaps a state actor uh, might use these chemicals uh, in a terrorist event or in some kind of a warfare uh, situation. And so we want to be ready. What we're seeking is uh, treatment or a set of treatments uh, that um, are able to terminate the seizures more readily uh, and also very importantly uh, that uh, can reduce <coughs> the likelihood uh, that an individual who is exposed to the nerve agent uh, will develop a long-term uh, brain injury uh, and also prevent the development of subsequent epilepsy. And the question is what are the mechanisms that lead from the very acute responses to the exposures to these long-term neurologic sequelae that have been documented in both human and animals? Memory deficits, to acquired epilepsy, to um, psychiatric disorders. We really don't know. In vivo imaging gives us the opportunity to look not just at a single snapshot in time, but to be truly longitudinal and look at the same animal repeatedly over time. So you have this insult with the organophosphate that causes brain injury and that persists and it lasts a long time. And we're trying to identify and develop new therapies that could reduce that injury. And the only way to really know how well we're doing is to know how the animal is gonna do in the long run and also to see how is it going to do along the way. As a clinical neurologist who treats patients with seizures and epilepsy, uh, I'm particularly interested in the spin-offs uh, that the Counteract Center can make for human medicine uh, to take the treatments that we develop as a result of our studies in animals uh, and then study those in patients who experience uh, severe seizures in the community uh, setting. These are very complex problems. My training is in cell and molecular neurobiology, um, so I understand what's happening at the cell and molecular level in the brain, but I don't have the expertise to really understand what are the exposures I should be modeling in my laboratory. So this is why it's critically important that we reach out to exposure scientists. And so traffic-related air pollution or air pollution in general is a really great example of this. The idea really started because there um, had been studies in humans showing that exposure to air pollution affected the brain in various ways. So both in neurodevelopment as well as in neurodegenerative disease and Alzheimer's. And so we were able to work with a group of engineers at the Air Quality Research Center uh, who were able to build a vivarium adjacent to a highway tunnel and to use that to really look at the effects of air pollution, which is very dynamic over time. Nobody's really done a chronic, meaning a long-term exposure over the life of the animal in a real world built environment. So this is kind of the novelty of it. Trying to determine which chemicals and which subsets of chemicals, which um, profiles of chemicals are contributing to disease burden is extremely challenging. The other aspect of this is that these diseases are all very complex diseases, which is why we reach out to our medical colleagues to ask for their advice on what are biomarkers or endpoints we should be trying to model in our animals so we have a better uh, simile, if you will, of the human condition. We saw already at three months of of age, which is quite young for these animals, that they already had these hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And that was sort of 
both frightening, but also kind of a, an encouraging result because it, it tells us that, you know, the type of work that we're doing is meaningful. We do have the power to control environmental chemicals, but we need to know what they are and we need to develop really compelling evidence to show our regulators and our policymakers and our, our legal teams so they can really go to bat and get the policies in place to protect people from exposure to these chemicals. These kinds of problems that are becoming more and more complicated, and it's not just the health effects of air quality, it's, it's climate change, it's loss of biodiversity, I mean, overpopulation, there's a million issues going on that are very complex and, and, and people need to come out of their silo and connect and figure out how to address the problem uh, more community-wide. This is the only way we're really gonna make any inroads on these very complex uh, uh, problems.